There we go. All right. So the last thing that we need to talk about under the idea of reintegration is, is what is the story that's being told? And so under this, uh, I wrote on the board methodological naturalism. I mentioned it like 12 times yesterday before I wrote it on the board, even though I decided before I walked into class that I wouldn't say it until I wrote it on the board. But I got ahead of myself, I got excited. And so methodological naturalism, th that's, that's the overarching paradigm that represents everything science, okay? And so you, you have to realize that when you read a scientific textbook, unless it's written under a different paradigm, okay? You have to realize that, that, that there's a particular story uh, being told. And so what I, what I want to tell you, and, and I want you to know, and I want you to just believe that this is true, because it is, is that it's, it's not quite as simple as, like, let's just interpret some chapters of scripture allegorically and other chapters actual as actual history. It's not, it's not that simple. It is, it is not that simple. The paradigm digs much, much deeper than that. Okay. It's not that simple. For instance, um, this, this is, uh, a, a, what is kind of the dominant idea of biological and physical origins. So you start with nothing, and notice that's in quotation marks, because it's, it, you, you will see attempts to sell that you start with nothing, but you don't really start with nothing. What you start with is matter completely balanced by antimatter. So mathematically you have nothing, but it's not really nothing, right? So the key is something's eternal. And, and the, then the dominant idea of, of science, matter, is eternal, okay? So we start with nothing, but it's not really nothing you have a, a cataclysmic explosion where you get an enormous amount of material, of matter and energy spreading out from a central point, okay? In some places, this matter starts to coalesce and to form objects. In our solar system, at the center of that, you, 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 you get that matter coalescing to form the sun. When you start getting uh, hydrogen and different you know, types of hydrogen fusing together, uh, to make helium, and then uh, that provides you kind of some stability and some additional opportunity for other matter to coalesce and to start forming planets, okay? And so this is the idea that the sun forms at the center of the solar system. For, out, outside of that, other matter coalesces to form solid or gaseous objects uh, like Earth. From here, you get single-celled life, so you start with just no life, you get single-celled life, then you get some early eukaryotes. We'll talk about all this. If, if you don't know what, what these things mean, we'll talk about all this. I just want you to see the story. And then from there, we can get aquatic vertebrates like fish and other, other types of fish and other types of fish. And then from there, we can get land vertebrates. And then finally, we can get uh, to flying vertebrates. And so uh, this is, this is a, a summary of the dominant idea of physical and biological origins, okay? And uh, here's the story, and so it's not quite as simple as just saying, okay, well, Genesis 1 then must be allegorical, right? And it can't just be this whole idea of like day age, right? Where one day represents more than an actual day because the order is entirely wrong, right? So we've got day five, fish and birds are created on day five, right? Right? Okay, you can, you can tell me if I'm wrong. I'm not wrong, but you can tell me if, if I am wrong. But look, flying vertebrates come much later, right? So it's, it, it's certainly not a matter of just the days are more than actual days because the order's wrong. And then the sun even comes before the earth. That, I mean, that's completely wrong. And so it's, it's not just, you, you certainly can't just do, well, a day must be more than an actual day. It really requires that you say something like, well, Genesis 1 must be completely allegorical then. And then it's like, okay, well, then why does it exist, right? If it's completely allegorical, it must exist then to disprove some other creation story. But then you're like, all the other creation stories we have that are about the same age of the Bible, they basically tell the same story. And that's because they have a memory of what they've been told by God, right? And so it's like, well, that just seems very strange. And then on top of that, that it's not just a matter of the story being different, but methodological naturalism uh, puts its, I mean, digs its claws into every single thing. And it's like, there, you, you, not only can you not, um, 
explain the cause of every event, but we know that that cause can't be supernatural because that is just, it, it, it can't, there can't be anything supernatural to explain any causes. Not, not, it's not even just like we can explain every phenomenon through natural processes. It's that there, there cannot ever be any supernatural processes. Okay, so it's it's not just quite as simple as saying, okay, well, Genesis one maybe is allegorical, and then when we transition over to Genesis two, maybe we're getting something historical, or maybe even Genesis one through eleven, they're all allegorical, and then when we get Genesis twelve, now we have something that's historical. It's not that simple. The paradigm digs much much deeper than that, much much deeper than that, and it becomes very very difficult to try to harmonize what God's word teaches with this story. Okay, extremely difficult. I would argue impossible, but there are others that would not like that argument. So, on top of this, you get statements like this, that evolution by natural selection is the unifying concept. It's the only thing that allows everything in biology and chemistry and physics to make sense. That apart from evolution by natural selection, nothing, not nothing makes sense, but we can't ever understand the why. All you're stuck with is you can explain the how, how organisms do this or what they're doing, but you can never explain the why apart from an explanation referring to evolution by natural selection. Because there's no other suitable way to explain why. Okay? And so this is gonna become an important point as we get into some other organisms in the life, some other organisms, what does that even mean? Some other types of life and uh, we're gonna, you're, you're gonna need to remember this because I disagree with this and I think we have much better answers of why apart from this, okay? But that's, that's a story for another time, all right? Are there any questions about this? Because we are finally going to start talking about viruses and we're, was it uh, 15, no, 10 minutes in today plus the 55 before is that 65 minutes? 65 minutes into our class when I told you by email, like three days ahead of time, you need to be ready to start discussing chapter 21. And then I gave you 65 minutes of warm up for it. Why didn't you just tell us you were gonna warm us up? I don't know. It's because I'm evil. <laughs> we, we discussed that before class started. I don't, now it's on the recording, can't change that. All right, any questions on this? Because we're gonna, we're gonna get, into, get into viruses. Oh, I've seen, uh, as of just before class started, 18 of you have submitted your initial post on the discussion board. There are 44 of you in here, which means 44 minus 18, I think, is 28. No, 26. 26. 26 of you have not yet done that, and you have until midnight, which is actually Thursday, so you have until like 11.59 tonight to get that initial post in. Keep that in mind. Every Wednesday. Every Wednesday. Even when we do... Um, it used to be called Outreach Week. What, what, what's the name of Engage? Even when we do Engage in October, which if you don't know what that is yet, you will. Uh, and there are no night classes on Wednesday of that week, but you still need to have that initial post in by the end of Wednesday. Every week of the semester, except for Thanksgiving, you can take that week off. My gift to you. All right? Because I'm telling you, somebody's going to forget, and you're going to get half of the credit on the homework, and this is not good. That's Those should be... Those should be full credit every time. Every time. All right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, I like this textbook uh, not because of the, the worldview behind it. I mean, that's, I mean, unless you choose a textbook that's written from a different worldview, you have to deal with it. The reason I like this text is because every single chapter is written by an expert in that field. Rather than having like three authors write an entire biology textbook, there are like 47 authors on this textbook and every chapter is written by an actual expert in just that field of biology, which is nice. It's nice and it's free. I like that too. <clears throat> I like free textbooks. Unless you wanted it printed and to get the really high resolution images, which is great. And then it's just covering printing costs. All right, so when we go through chapters, I will go through it like this. I will give you a list of questions that are going to frame our conversations. Therefore, I call them framing questions because they frame our conversations. It's wonderful, right? Cherish when you see a word and it actually means what you think it means because it doesn't often happen in this class, okay? So whenever you see a word and actually means what you think it means, cherish it 
And then for the most of the time when it does it, make sure you know what it actually means and not what you think it means. Okay? Are we all right? So we're going to go through these question by question. They'll be the titles to our slides, and we'll work through these questions and then get you some of the data. So first question we're going to deal with is this one. How did scientists know about viruses before the electron microscope? And so this is a, a neat discussion to have. One, you get to talk about light versus electron microscopy. Um, but another discussion we get to have is just how on earth do you know the existence of something before you actually see it? And you should have a very simple way to answer this question because you should be able to think of plenty of examples where we knew about the existence of something before we ever saw it. And it almost always relates to disease, right? Because you can see the effects of that even if you don't know what's causing it, right? Just, you know, putting that out there. Now, my background is in parasitology. And the nice thing about parasites, most of them are large enough that you can see them with, without microscopy. So if you're like, man, this person's got some serious bowel distress and they're shedding worms in their feces, you're like, I'm pretty sure I know what's causing that, right? It's that, that eight inch worm that they're voiding with their feces, right? Doesn't work that way with bacteria and certainly not with viruses. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about light versus electron microscopy. Oh my gosh, <laughs> Professor Kornoff. I need to start bringing my markers. Anyways, okay, so. <laughs> oh, no, no, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll deal with it this way. Okay, so how many of you have seen the electromagnetic spectrum? Where you've got like a thing that represents all of the different frequencies of light and then there's like a portion of it and it says visible light. Okay, it's most of you, okay? If not all of you. So we have, this, we have this electromagnetic spectrum, right? Which represents all of the different frequencies of light. And only a very small portion of that is visible light. That's a very important concept to understand when you're thinking about light microscopy. Because the smallest wavelength of light that you can physically see that's the smallest resolution you can get with light microscopy, okay? And just, you know, I was going to write this on the board, but it, it's, it, you, you don't have to know it. I just want to frame this and help you to understand why light microscopy can be used to see viruses. The smallest wavelength of light that a human can see is about 350 nanometers. And you're like, what does that even mean? A nanometer is one billionth of a meter. And you're like, well, what is a meter, right? This is America. Right? The meter's about three and a quarter feet, okay? So um, a billionth of that, that's a really small unit of, of, of distance, okay? But 350 nanometers is significantly larger than, than viral particles, okay? Viral particles at their biggest, maybe 200 nanometers, at their biggest. That's just, just over half of the smallest objects you can see with light microscopy, right? So we had light microscopes, they were good, but you couldn't see viruses. So the question is, well, how did, how did they know that these viruses existed if they didn't have better resolution? It's a wonderful question. Thank you for asking it and facilitating this discussion. It's wonderful. You had some very brilliant people that loved God and believed that God created a very ordered universe. And they believed that God created us as the stewards of his creation. And they believe that if that is true, we have to be able to understand how creation works. And if that is true, it must be ordered. And if God is ordered, his creation should be ordered. And so one of these men was Pasteur, and he didn't like the idea. They, they had this idea that life would just originate. Like if you left a bottle of sugar water sitting out, that it would just, living organisms would, would just magically appear inside of it which sort of makes sense if you don't understand, you can't see these organisms, and then all of a sudden, like, they, 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 they thought this, what they would do to, um, to brew, like, alcoholic beverages, right? They knew that there was some living organism that was generating what, what made the alcohol. But they didn't know what it was, but they just put, say, a bowl out with some bread and some water in it, and then all of a sudden you started generating alcohol. So the idea was that those living organisms kind of appeared in that solution and then started converting you know, the sugars in there, 
or whatever that 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 food source uh, into alcohol. But Pasteur didn't didn't believe that. He believed that God created a very ordered universe and life doesn't just appear wherever randomly. And so he built a a paper that was a filter that was so finely filtered it would filter out any bacterium that they knew of. Okay, any bacterium that they knew of that they had seen or at least characterized. And then another researcher, Dmitry Ivanovsky, he demonstrated that if you took a sick tobacco plant, there was something wrong with it. It had, it had a disease, so they knew something was causing that disease. And you took fluid from that plant and you passed it through this filter that filtered out all of the bacteria and all of the known pathogens and then gave a healthy plant that fluid that it would get the disease. And so that they knew that there had to be some pathogen even smaller than bacteria and smaller than pathogens that they had already described and represented. And so this is how they knew that there had to be some other category of pathogen that was even smaller than bacteria that existed. They didn't know exactly what it was. They hadn't characterized it, um, but they, they knew it was something. And so this, uh, this tobacco, this is tobacco mosaic virus. Uh, by the way, is what is the pathogen causing this disease. And it was the first virus ever discovered. And probably gives you an idea of where the money was uh, in, in terms of when this kind of research was being done. Because scientific discovery either happens by accident or it happens because there's a lot of money available for that research. Okay? And tobacco was a very valuable crop. And so there was a lot of money being invested to figure out what is causing this disease? So virions, which are single viral particles, are about 100 times smaller than the average bacterium. And so here's you, your, your virions range from 20 nanometers to 250 nanometers. Again, keeping in mind, the smallest object we can see with light microscopy is 350 nanometers. Okay? And so we have some that are as small as 20 less than 10% the size of the smallest object you can see with light microscopy. Hence the need for other types of microscopy. Like the question, how did we know virus existed before electron microscopy? Electrons also travel as a wave like light, but their wavelength is really, really small compared to light. So you get higher resolution. But you have to coat the object in gold before you can do it, so it's expensive and it kills whatever you're looking at. It's unfortunate. But, unless it's a virus and you don't mind. So here's uh, tobacco mosaic virus. Here are some uh, images, electron microscopy images of the individual virions, the individual particles. And here's some of the example pathology on the tobacco leaves. And by the way, the leaves are the plant that you use. Don't know if you knew that. So it's kind of bad when the disease is happening on the object of the plant that you need. Unless, of course, anyways, sorry. <laughs> Um, so here's another image about just how small uh, viruses are. So here are cells lining the human colon. Okay, these are cells lining the human colon. These are E. coli cells. Some of you had lab yesterday. You already saw these E. coli, these rod-shaped bacteria. And then here is a virus that infects E. coli. So here's an individual E. coli, and here's the virus. These are really, really small. These are really small. Uh, Organisms. No, they're not organisms. They're not living. I just said something that's wrong. They are not organisms. These are really small things. <laughs> Bringing back that technical term from Monday. You're welcome. All right. So as is customary, I like to do a lecture break about 20 to 25 minutes in. This week, won't always happen, this week our lecture break is going to be the question that you're supposed to respond to on the discussion board. So what I'd like for you to do is I'd like for you to spend about a minute talking with those around you, and I would like for one of you or several of you to teach the rest of the people in there why we do not consider viruses to be living organisms. All right? Why don't we consider viruses to be living organisms? One minute, starting now. <laughs> I 
All right. All right. Now, I want you all to know two things. One is that I oftentimes pull exam questions from these discussion questions, meaning probably a good idea to write down what people are saying in response to these questions, and especially a good idea to write down what I say in response to these questions, right? Okay. And uh, number two is I want you to know that this is a safe place to be wrong, okay? So feel free to share your answers or your thoughts because this is a safe place to be wrong. And if you say it quiet enough, it won't pick it up on the recording, right? <laughs> and then there's no actual evidence other than, you know, um, what, what would you call that? Um, oh, gosh, based on stories. Somebody give me that term there. Anecdotal. There we go. Anecdotal evidence, right? Other than the people shared there. Thank you. All right. So what are some thoughts? Why aren't viruses considered living organisms? We had some, on Monday, we talked about characteristics of life, things that living organisms either have or that they do. Okay? Yeah. So viruses don't have metabolism and they don't have cell structure? Yeah, so they aren't cells and they don't have cells, right? Which is something living organisms, they either have cells or they are cells. Mm -hmm. uh, and they don't metabolize. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So once they're reassembled in a host cell, they come out in their mature form, so they don't grow. Yeah, they don't grow and develop. That's good. They, they, they're either assembled or they're not assembled. Good. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they don't make copies of themselves, right? I mean, they do, but not on their own. They hijack our, our cells machinery. Yeah, any other ideas? So they don't metabolize. They don't grow and develop. They don't make copies of themselves. Yeah, they don't move, they don't, they don't respond to stimuli and, and execute some <clears throat> response to that, although they are triggered by the presence of <clears throat> bacterial cells. But anyways, it's another story for another time. Yeah, DNA or RNA, but not always yeah so we said that living, living organisms have DNA, and some viruses do. Some viruses do have DNA, which you're like, that, that's really weird. Why does this virus have DNA? Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of, a lot of viruses do. Yeah. They don't maintain homeostasis. Yeah, they don't maintain homeostasis. Good. And so there are a lot of the most of the characteristics of life are absent from viruses. But they are obviously still active. They're machines. And they're highly effective machines. And we'll see this uh, even later on. We'll talk about some other types of pathogens that are similar to viruses. But they are certainly machines. And this brings up some really interesting questions about where do viruses actually come from and brings up some very interesting questions on how do you actually combat viral infections? And we'll have some discussion on Friday about why is it so difficult to treat viruses after the infection? You can prepare your body for them, that's fairly easy, but to actually fight them after the fact is very challenging. Although one of the most famous viruses that there is, HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, we are very blessed by that virus doing something very specific that allows us to actually attack that virus and treat it very effectively. But anyways, it's another conversation for a little bit later. This is a little snapshot of what's coming. A foreshadowing, you might say. Creating tension, right? You're like, I want that. I'm hungry. <laughs> It's like an appetizer, right? It's not satisfying. It's just, it's, just, it's just frustrating, right? Especially if you have to wait for the meal after the appetizer. All right, so the next question, how can we organize and classify viruses? So there's several ways we can do this. Several ways we can organize and classify viruses. And really, you can answer, how do we organize and classify anything with these same answers? 
And so let's think about this, because viruses are a little bit more abstract. We, the average person tends to know less about viruses than they, they do about mammals. So let's ask the question, how do we organize and classify mammals? Yeah? By species. OK, so we can organize them by species. And how do we do that? OK, by how they, what, where they live and what they use, what they need for survival. Yeah. OK. Their structure, good. What else? Yeah. OK. What they eat. What they eat, good. So you can organize them by how they look, how they act, where you find them, right? There are a number of ways we can organize that. So what about if we do that for viruses? How they look, what they do, and where you find them. It's a wonderful way. It's a wonderful way to answer that question. Good job, everyone. So, oh, this is just like a little aside. This is a little nugget of truth for you. Most researchers believe that viruses do not share a common ancestor. And basically, it's a fancy way of saying that there are multiple origins of viruses, that viruses originated many times. And this is interesting, because then it's like, well, what are these viruses? Are they degenerate cells, right? Did they used to be living cells that have degenerated into just the simplest form of the machinery within that cell? Right? Or are they just escaped nucleic acids, right? Either RNA or the viruses that have DNA. Is it just, are they just like renegade pieces of nucleic acid with enough machinery to keep them alive and uh, to, you know, to, to get them inside of the host? Or another idea, and this is the most popular idea of the origin of viruses, is that they basically evolved alongside of the original survival machines. This is a term we're gonna see a lot in this class because I think from a perspective of methodological naturalism, it's the absolute best way to think of any living organism. It's really depressing and dark and you know just sad. Um, but really from a perspective of methodological naturalism, a living organism is nothing more than just a survival machine for the, for the, the, the nucleic acids. The, the molecule that determines what the object is. This is kind of fun, okay? But in a depressing, you know, sad kind of way. Like watching Forrest Gump, right? <laughs> so it's fun, but in a depressing, sad kind of way. That is in no way an endorsement of the film or an encouragement <laughs> to watch it in any way. Okay. All right. So you can organize viruses on how they look, right? We talked about this with mammals. You can organize mammals based on how they're structured. You can organize viruses based on how they're structured. And so we have some different types of viruses. You have filamentous viruses. This is like strands, like tobacco mosaic virus, right? We saw that virion, and it's, it's a strand. We have some that are isometric, that are these really complex geometric shapes, like almost not spherical, but like dodecahedrons. Right, which is a 12-sided, you know, uh, three-dimensional object. They could be enveloped or enveloped, uh, meaning that they're covered with some kind of a membrane. You're like, where on earth did they get that membrane? Where on earth did they get that membrane? Where did it come from? Come from the host. So when they replicate inside the host and then blow the host cell up as they leave, some of them take the membrane with them. That's pretty sinister. Because now your immune system, when it looks at that, is not going to see a virus. It's going to see your cell. Man, that is awesome. It's like the Trojan horse, right? <laughs> except for not, because that was, that, it's not like that at all, actually. I mean, except for that, it's hiding. But that, it would be like if, mm, it'd be like if the Spartans were hiding inside of a Trojan body, right? <laughs> Wait, it's not, it wasn't the, it was the, it was, it was the, who, it wasn't even the Spartans. Where was, where was Odysseus from? Was he in, yeah, he was from Greece. Was he an Athenian? Where was he from? He wasn't from Sparta. Man, I'm getting, I'm using an analogy I wasn't even prepared to handle. This is terrible. This is terrible. It's nothing like the Trojan horse. It's nothing, nothing like it. Uh, and then you have head and tail viruses. And so I showed you an image of E. coli and a teeny tiny little virus stuck to its surface, that was a head and tail virus. You've got a head unit and then you have this weird robotic tail that actually grabs onto the host. It's fantastic. Fantastic. So we can organize viruses based on how they're structured. 
Uh, we can organize viruses based on what they have. What type of nucleic acid do they have? Do they have DNA? Do they have RNA? Do they have double-stranded DNA or single-stranded DNA? Do they have double-stranded RNA or single-stranded RNA? And if they have single-stranded RNA, is it the right type of RNA to just write into protein? Oh, man. Oh, I need a marker. Do you want to go get it, Emerson? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We'll wait. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, she knew where some markers were. So I'm setting her free to go and get it. I don't, there we go. I like that. Oh, you know what I should have did? I should have did Jacob and Esau, right? <laughs> that was the analogy I am prepared to handle, right? A wolf in sheep's clothing, that works as well. Yeah, the Trojan horse, it broke down right away, especially since I don't even remember where Odysseus is from. Ithaca. Ithaca. Mmm, so is the, the, the Ithacans? I don't even know. Thank you very much, Emerson. All right, so you can organize viruses on the type of their nucleic acid, um, their genome structure, core, and, uh, or you could do it based on the organism that you find them in. You could do animal viruses, plant viruses, so where you find them. Basically, the three things we came up with for mammals. The most common way of organizing viruses is based on the type of nucleic acid, and it's called Baltimore classification. So we need to take a moment to talk about nucleic acids. Not a lot, because this isn't a cell biology class, but just enough so that we're all on the same page, or at least in the same chapter. Okay? There's also an analogy I was ready to handle. Oh, you missed it, Emerson. We changed it. He, he offered a wolf in sheep's clothing, and then I said Jacob as Esau, right? Right? Let's just slap some goat skin on and put on Esau's clothing. But the voice, it's so wrong. All right. Um, oh, yeah, so Baltimore classification. So there are seven types of viruses, and they're all based on the type of nucleic acid. Okay? We good? All right. So we need to talk a little bit about amino acids. In most, in, in most living organisms, every individual has two full copies of the DNA. But we already know DNA is a characteristic of living organisms, right? We mentioned that on Monday. And so DNA is double-stranded in living organisms. So we've got double-stranded DNA. This is DNA. And this right here is packaged inside of the nucleus. This right here is the nucleus. All right? So that's where we're at. This is, this is a typical living organism. And you're like, well, what about bacteria? They don't have nuclei. You're right, we'll talk about that next week. But this is a typical living organism, not representing the sheer number of species, but what is the typical among all of the varieties of forms. Anyways, another story for another time. So here's the DNA, right? And then here are proteins. Let's do this. That's, that's deliberately squiggly like that. You'll, we'll get to that, not in this class. So this is a protein. And so the DNA provides the code for how you make these proteins. And I'm like, well, that's awesome, right? It's like the blueprints are built into every cell, and every cell needs to generate these products. It's such an efficient design, and you're right. But then we have a problem. The DNA is stuck here, and we need this protein here. We're like, we've, we've got a problem. Either the DNA leaves, needs to leave the nucleus in order to get that code out there. And this is a huge molecule. I don't know if you knew this or not, but in the average cell in your body, there is six feet of DNA. You have, your cell number of human cells is in the trillions. And every single one of those cells has about six feet of DNA in it. Like, man, that's a lot of material. And it seems pretty inefficient to get that big of a code outside to make every single protein. I think there's a better way to handle that. And you're right, there is. You, you open this up and you read just a portion of it Right? Let's say the protein coding region is just this little tiny piece, and then you write it as a different type of nucleic acid, because DNA stays in the nucleus and is double-stranded, and you write it as RNA. Mm -hmm. Notice it's smaller. That's the key to the drawing there. Okay? It's smaller, it's just a piece of the DNA, and the RNA, look at this, it leaves the nucleus, and then something really cool happens. Maybe they're not going to do that one. We're going to do, do this 
wow, well, where am I? There we go. We're going to do this one. And we have a process that's called translation. And, and we're just gonna we're just gonna say that this process happens, and then you get from RNA into protein through this process of translation. Okay, and so you're like, okay, we got this. All living organisms they have DNA. DNA is double stranded. Okay, some viruses have DNA, some don't. Okay, but 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 we're we're okay, right? All right. Now viruses, some of them do have DNA, some of them don't. Okay. So the way we classify viruses, again, the most common way is using Baltimore classification, and it based on the type of nucleic acid. And so they, they can have DNA or they can have RNA. And then they can have double-stranded DNA or they could have single-stranded RNA. And then they could have really neat stuff that actually, anyways, we'll, we'll get to the other neat stuff in a minute. All right. So here's organizing viruses based on their structure. These are all really complex viruses. Here's a head and tail virus. So you can tell that because it says tail. It's got a line pointing to it. It's not labeling the head. Oh, it is right there in the other picture. <laughs> Look at that, a head and tail virus. And then here would be like isohedral viruses, really complex viruses. The filamentous, like tobacco mosaic, those are very simple uh, viruses. But that's organizing them based on structure. Uh, here would be more um, based on whether they're enveloped, you could tell that this is a, an envelope virus because look at that, it says viral envelope. I don't know if you can read that in the back because it's pretty blurry even right here, but it comes right out of your textbook. This is an envelope virus. And then here's showing you some of the you know, pathology so we can organize viruses that way. This one's fun, but you know, we'll skip this slide. Here's the Baltimore classification. And so it's, it's really nice because it goes, it, it, it's, got a, it's got a rhythm to it. Uh, it, it's double, single, double, single, but then it goes single, double. I don't know why. They, they had a really nice rhythm, uh, but, then the, but then they ruined it. So it was like double, single, double, single. And you're like, wait, but there's an extra single in there. Let's talk about that, okay? So type 1 viruses have double strand because it's, it's double, single, double, single, and then it ruined it. They just flipped it. So you just got to remember they got tired at the end and confused, disoriented. <laughs> And so they messed it up. But you're like, okay, well, it's double single, double single. So this, we're starting with DNA, right? D comes before R alphabetically. It's nice. We'll start with DNA because it comes first alphabetically. So there are viruses with double-stranded DNA. And you're like, well, those living organisms have double-stranded DNA. Are those viruses living? Remember, that's only one of the characteristics of life, having DNA, right? They're still not living. So type 1 viruses in the Baltimore classification have double-stranded DNA. Remember, double, single, double, single, and then single, double, okay? We start with DNA because it comes first al alphabetically. Then you have viruses that have single-stranded DNA, okay? So if you have viruses that have double-stranded DNA, we're like, if these viruses are going to replicate their materials, they need to make RNA because that's what our machinery uses to, for translation, right? They need to make RNA. Well, that's fine. Our cells have the machinery to turn DNA into RNA because it happens all the time, right? If a virus has single-stranded DNA, they still need to go from DNA to RNA, but it's just a different type of DNA. But it's okay. Our, our, our cells, I mean, it's okay for the virus. Our cells have the machinery to turn DNA into RNA, okay? So double, single, starting with DNA. But if a virus has DNA as its nucleic acid, it's going to have to convert that into RNA. But we have the machinery to do that, and it'll hijack that machinery. Now let's get into RNA. Okay, and so again, we go double, single. Double, single, double, single, and then single, double. Okay, so some viruses have double-stranded RNA. You're like, well, that's a little strange. It's different because RNA in living organisms isn't double-stranded most of the time. So in order to do this, they're going to have to split those two strands. Okay, but it's something that's easy to accomplish. And you're like, well, why do we have two single here? Why do we have two single here? And it's because you have to. Because listen to this, okay? So we've got single-stranded RNA. You're like, that's the exact type of nucleic acid that goes through translation. Like, it's wonderful, right? So you're like, this virus is already ready to start translating. It doesn't have to do, you know, leading up work to get to this process. Unless... 
it's the RNA that it has is not ready to be translated. And so that's why we have two different types of single-stranded RNA. One of it where it's already ready to be translated. It is, it's not the template, it's, it's the code. And then some viruses have the template and not the code. So they actually have to write the template before it can be translated. And you're like, this seems so good. Why, aren't all vi why don't all viruses choose this way? It seems so efficient, right? Once their genetic material's in, it's ready to be translated. There aren't any intermediate steps. And this is why very few people think all viruses have the same origin. Because if they did, you would think that it would come to this. And it seems to be that viruses actually are degenerate cells. That they've just, they are like renegade degenerate cells that have lost the ability to function. And that's probably the origin of, of most viruses. Anyways, that's another story for another time. So we've got double single, double single, but we have to have two single when we get to RNA because it could either be the code or the template for the code. Or the, the uh, yeah, we have, we'll just call it the template for writing the code. And then unfortunately it gets to single double instead of doing double single again. Double single, double single and then single double. These viruses, these viruses, so this one has RNA, but it actually gets written back into DNA. And this has DNA, but it gets written back into DNA. And you're like, it's already DNA. Why would it get written back into DNA? Let's think about this. What, what advantage does that provide these viruses if they actually get written back into DNA? What's that? Yeah, they can hide in the genetic code of their host. And it's only possible for these viruses because they're programmed that no matter what nucleic acid they have, that they're going to get written backwards. Maybe that's why they did it backwards. I didn't even, I've never thought about this. It's like double single, double single, and then this one's backwards, but they have to move backwards. Maybe they did that on purpose. Look at that. Maybe it wasn't like an act of confusion and fatigue, but it was actually with some purpose. I don't know, but. It sounds good to me. So these viruses can hide out, I mean, literally for, for generations, can hide in the host DNA and get passed on to offspring, and then something triggers them to come out of the host DNA and actually start replicating. It's fantastic. And you know what's something that's really cool? This is bonus information. You're not going to be assessed on this in any way. The part of our genome that helps our immune system attack viruses looks like it inserted from a virus. That a virus actually inserted itself into our genome, giving ourselves, giving ourselves the capability to fight other viruses. But, pff, that, what on earth is that for? Like, that doesn't make any sense. But it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Okay, so this is Baltimore classification. And it's double single, double single. DNA comes first because D comes before R alphabetically. And then since these have to move backwards, this is backwards. Use that to remember that. Okay? Yeah. So I'm confused. Why can't the other DNA groups one and two hide in themselves? Yeah, it's a good question. So they, they need in order to in order to move backwards, they need some or in order to get into the nucleus, they need some machinery to actually do the backwards reaction. And so um, if your cell, I mean, you, your cells end up with foreign DNA in them all the time. So like the cells that line your intestinal tract, I mean, if you eat any living organism, which is almost everything we eat, right, unless you're eating rocks and sand and stuff, <laughs> um, you're getting foreign DNA that ends up getting inside of those cells, and the cell's default is to break that down. Okay, it has machinery to break that down and harness the energy that's inside of it. And so you, you, need some, you need some mechanism. And so these viruses have huge genomes compared to other viruses. A typical virus genome is very, very small compared to other, I was going to say other living organisms. They're not living organisms. Compared to living organisms, viruses tend to have very, very small genomes. So our genome is about 3 billion bases. Okay? And then you have two full copies of it in every cell. So you have about 6 billion bases in every cell. That's why you have 6 feet of DNA. The average vi viral genome is usually somewhere on the order of like 300 to 1,500 bases. Really small genomes, like the bare minimum, because they hijack host machinery to do almost everything. But these viruses have to have huge genomes because they have to provide machinery to actually work backwards, 
to get inside of the nucleus? That's a good question. All right, so we got it, double single, double single, DNA comes first, and then when we get to RNA, is that single, is it the actual code, or is it just the template to, to write the code? <sighs> it almost feels like we have all these, like these are all separate origins of viruses, right? Almost feels that way. All right, here's some examples, some more examples of the diversity of viral forms. Again, if you're going to do it based on structural components, you've got um, I, I, isohedral or uh, isometric viruses. We've got filamentous, uh, really complex uh, viruses. There's, there's, a, there's a wide variety of different shapes, okay? But there are only seven varieties of the nucleic acids, giving us seven classifications. So it's easier to manage. It's easier to manage. And then it, it's, it's nice. It's double single, double single. And then they move backwards, so you flip it and do single double. All right? Cool. Single stranded RNA and double stranded DNA. All right. One last question that we're going to deal with is why would you target reverse transcriptase in HIV? I told you I, I gave you a little foreshadow, right? A little appetizer. Increasing your hunger and your desire. Here's the meal, right? Not that the Baltimore classification, you know, wasn't as good. This was, that was a really good appetizer, you know. <laughs> Why would you target reverse transcriptase to fight HIV? So what's the challenge of fighting viruses inside of your body? Let's think about this. Okay? Yeah. There's a lot of different places where you can target them. Yeah, right? These things are tiny, right? They're, I mean, basically, your body's their oyster. I actually, the, the world's your oyster, I don't know what that saying actually means. So I, I tried to change it, I don't know, even know if that works. I don't know the origin of that. Um, but anyways, like there's so many places to hide, right? They're, they're teeny tiny. Yeah, why else? Why, why, are, viruses, why are viruses complicated? Uh, they can mutate. Yeah, they can mutate. They mutate very, very quickly. That is true of viruses. Yep, that is true. Yeah. Take them with like other cells. Yeah, right? They, as they escape your cell, they'll take part of your cell membrane with them. And so your immune system looks at it and it's like, wow, that's a really small cell, but it's, it's reading as, as my cell, so I don't know what to do, right? But they don't do anything for themselves, right? They hijack all of your cell's machinery. So if you were gonna combat a virus and try to stop it from replicating, the only way you could do it would be to stop your cell from replicating, right? Because the same machinery to make the cell replicate is what the virus hijacks to make it self-replicate, okay? It's the same difficulties that you have in trying to fight cancer cells, okay? It's like in order to combat the cancer cell, you have to target the way our cells function, right? It's incredibly challenging. But there's something wonderful about HIV. It is a type six virus. And what does that mean? All right, double, single, double, single, single. So it's single because it's backwards when we got to the end there. Yeah, it's revert. It's it's got a it's single stranded RNA, and it has to go back into the host DNA, which means it's bringing with it some unique machinery, some unique machinery that our cells don't make, and so now you have something that's actually unique that you can target as you fight that virus. And it's wonderful because it's very rare, as far as viruses are concerned, to have something like that that's unique that you can target. And that's why viruses are very difficult to treat, but you can do, uh, like, uh, there are antiviral medications and they try to, you know, wake up the part of your immune system that's good at fighting viruses. But most of the time you have to treat viruses by trying to prevent people from getting them, right? And you give them vaccines and get their immune system ready to attack anything that looks like that. Because once you get it, it's, it's really difficult. So you could, this is, these are places where you can target viruses. You can target where they attach to the host cell, because that's some unique machinery, right? Where they actually attach to the host cell. Your, your cells probably aren't attaching to each other in the same way. You could attack the machinery used to penetrate that host cell to get its genetic material in. You could attack the uncoding process, which actually unwraps itself to get that genetic material in. 
You could attack the replication, but that's tough, again, because they hijack the host cell machinery to replicate themselves. So if you attack replication, you're going to attack the cell's ability to make copies of itself, which is tough. It's tough. You could attack assembly, but again, that's hijacking a lot of cell machinery. You can attack where they release. There are some machinery to help them get out of the cell because typically your cells are not inside of other cells, right? So they don't need machinery to erupt. But the whole key is, is you want to attack places that are unique, that have something novel so that it's not going to destroy a normal process in the process of destroying the virus, right? This is the wonderful thing about HIV and all retroviruses. Type six and type seven are called retroviruses because they work backwards, right? Retro means, I think, from the past or something like that, right? If you're like, oh, we're having a retro day, right? Freshmen dressed from the 50s and sophomores the 60s. Did you all do that in high school, like during uh, spirit week? Yeah, my no? high school does. Yeah, my high school did, and I never did it. <laughs> I'm going to dress the same way every day, no matter what. What's that? Six and seven are retroviruses. Yep. So HIV is a retrovirus, and so it has a huge amount of unique machinery, giving you a wonderful place to attack that virus. And it's, you can attack HIV without actually attacking the host cell. And it's wonderful. And this is why there have been people that have had HIV for going on 30 years and have never developed AIDS because you know, just they're constantly taking drugs that attack that that um, reverse transcriptase, that unique machinery to retroviruses. And so here is uh, one of those drugs, AZT, reverse transcriptase inhibitor, fancy way of saying a, a protein that inhibits the work of this enzyme. Okay. And so it's, it's wonderful. It's just, it's wonderful. There are other viruses that, that we don't have this opportunity. And so when, they, when we get outbreaks, you, you almost have to let them run their course, right? It's you quarantine and let the virus run its course. Yeah. Does AZT cure HIV? No. Mm -mm. Nope, it just, it just combats viral growth. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. All right. Well, it is currently 12.39. And uh, in lieu of going to another slide and not being able to finish it, if you have finished all you want to write about this slide, you are free to go. Use that minute wisely. I don't know how much you can accomplish in a minute, but probably a lot, probably more than you think. So, Emerson, thank you so much. Yeah. Can this go dark? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs>